Uh, welcome to the fifth and final session of the Urbanism Awards Revisited series, uh, where the Academy have sought to reunite some of the past finalists from the past 14 years of the awards. I'm Francis Newton, uh, Lead Assessor for Great Places. Um, I'm also a town planner, urban designer and urbanist, um, and I'm a um, senior town planner with City of Edinburgh. I'd also like to introduce today uh, Rob Thompson and David Lum, who've provided their deputy lead this year, and I've been very um, pleased to have their assistance in the awards. So this is the fourth year I've acted as lead assessor for Great Places. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed participating in the awards. I think I've visited around 15 finalists now, as well as uh, those from several other um, categories. Um, and it's always a real privilege to meet those people who've had first-hand insight and experience in helping shape those places um, I'd also highly recommend taking part in one of the assessment visits um, if you haven't previously, um, and hopefully next year they'll be back in their, their usual format. Um, I suppose all the awards uh, categories uh, consider places in, their, in a broadest sense, um, but I think the great places category perhaps um, for me offers the greatest variety and captures um, those that perhaps don't naturally fit into one of the other categories. Um, Whilst invariably most of the finalists uh, have a clear component of urban space within them, um, the category considers a wide range of urban environments, including regeneration projects, um, the revitalization of established historic spaces, but also the creation of entirely new urban spaces as borne out in the projects we're going to be looking at today. Um, although it's a real shame that we've not been able to visit the finalists this year, it's always, um, I think this, this, this format has provided an excellent opportunity to uh, reflect on the quality of three past finalists and look at how they've continued to evolve since the original assessment. So today we're going to look at three of the 42 great places um, the Academy have visited over the past 14 years, um, as voted for by the Academy early this year. These include um, two very high profile city centre public realm projects in Bradford, West Yorkshire and Sheffield in South Yorkshire. Um, both have been highly successful and influential in the restructuring and recreating those cities. And we also have the Viking Triangle, um, a, a major regeneration initiative of an historic quarter in Waterford in Ireland. I suppose the common theme in all these places is they took on an unloved and perhaps an undervalued part of their respective town or, or city and transformed it. Uh, and in doing so, they perhaps saw something that no one else had and exhibited great determination and vision in driving these initiatives forward. Um, before we move further, I would like to um, introduce you to our sponsor. Uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce um, Elizabeth Randall, who's the Head of Public Spaces for Grosvenor across Britain and Ireland, and she would like to say a few words. Francis, thank you very much. Hello, and on behalf of Grosvenor, I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's Learning from the Great Places event, and this recently rare opportunity to get out and about through the eyes of the speakers from Bradford, Waterford and Sheffield with the Academy of Urbanists. At Grosvenor, throughout our 340 year history, we've taken a long term approach to the business of understanding the cities and local communities in which we operate. And through learning from the past, we strive to have a positive impact on our communities today, while being alive and responsive to the needs of future generations. We know that listening to our local communities, working in partnership across public and private sectors, and understanding the longer term sustainability of place are all crucial ingredients for success. The opportunity to learn from today's three great places in a lockdown is very valuable and I do thank the Academy for transforming this event to virtual so that we can all continue to learn and apply lessons to the improvement of the towns and cities where we work. There is, of course, an ever increasing understanding of the importance of health and well being and the impact that great places have on our morale. So, the work of the Academy plays a significant leadership role here, not least because the people 
and organizations that create and sustain great places are the essential ingredient. And we can meet them today through the work of the Academy. I'm really looking forward to hearing from today's speakers. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Elizabeth. And we're very grateful for Grosner for um, their continuing support in hosting the awards. Um, so we'll now move forward to um, the presentations. Before we start with these, can I remind everybody to um, place your questions in the chat uh, and we'll monitor those as they come through. Um, we'll probably um, put the question um, back to the um, individuals so they can post them to the panelists directly. Um, okay, we'll now in alphabetical order, we'll turn to our first finalist, which is City Park in Bradford. Um, so City Park was a winner of the awards in 2013, and it also prompted the Academy to hold the Congress there that same year. Um, I wasn't involved in the original assessment visit, but I, I did make a personal visit there last year, and it was quickly apparent um, that it was a highly exemplary project and probably one of the finest public realm interventions of its type in the UK over the past decade. Um, it's also one of those great places that are featured in the um, Urbanism Awards book published in 2016. Um, so I'd now like to introduce uh, Sheila O'Neill, who's the Assistant Director for Economy and Development for um, the City of Bradford Metropolitan Council. Um, I think she's pretty much lived and breathed City Park from its inception and continues to be closely involved with its ongoing management. So there's probably no one better qualified and more passionate about the project than Sheila. Um, I'd also like to introduce her colleague, Julian Jackson, who's um, Assistant Director for the Council's Planning, Transport and Highways. Um, and he's going to say a little bit about how City Park has uh, contributed to the ongoing regeneration of the city. Um, okay. So I'd also just like to say I'm particularly grateful for them for giving up their time um, this week. Um, they've been hugely um, involved in coordinating the council's response to a major fire in the city centre. So your time is, is very much appreciated. Uh, okay, Sheila, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on the clock because I'm, I'm warned I've got to finish in time for Julian. Um, and I will be saying to Olga, just next slide quite abruptly, and Olga's aware of that, so I'm not being rude. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here talking about City Park again. It's a tremendous um, achievement for Bradford and a tremendous achievement personally. I feel very proud of the work we've done. And as Francis said, we did win the award in 2013 when the, the, the feature, the development was actually quite new, but we're still getting used to it and getting to know each other. Um, so if we move on now, Olga, we'll go to the first slide proper. So the origins of the scheme, as many of you will know, is it was derived from the Allsop Master Plan in 2003, which was a piece of work commissioned by the Council, Yorkshire Forward, and um, what was then English Partnerships at the time. And the Bradford Centre Regeneration was the urban regeneration company tasked with coming in and delivering regeneration in the city. I think what I would like to convey about the importance of the Master Plan, many of you will know it, is that it did a number of important things. One, it was high profile and, and Will himself was quite a character and quite well known. And that was a positive, I think, for Bradford. Um, but it did two things. It brought water back to the surface of the city centre. Um, if you don't know, there are seven water courses run right under the city centre and Bradford had a history of flooding. Um, the industry that grew up around Bradford and made it a very wealthy city was driven by the quality of the water and the plentifulness of the water. So it was a really significant move bringing that water back to the surface. The other thing that um, Will did in that work with the Allsop Master Plan was remove buildings and remove roads. So he took infrastructure out um, and this was partly a, a symptom and response to an underperforming economy and that there was an oversupply of commercial space and an undersupply of public space. So I think they're the two things that really stuck with me from the, uh, the master plan work. I started in 2003 at Bradford Council at the time that the plan was being launched. And one of my first roles was to um, staff the consultation stand. And I'm born and brought up in Bradford. So hugely proud of having the opportunity to work on this project. And one of the questions we asked people was, do you like visiting water features? And absolutely without exception, they said yes. When you asked them, do you want one in Bradford? They absolutely without exception said no. It will be full of shopping trolleys and rats. The council won't look after it. It will be a disaster. And so that was the base that we were starting from. So if we move on, um, Olga, 
we set about trying to make sure that we won people's hearts with this scheme. And I'm not a designer by background, um, not an herbalist by background. My role was generally around the funding packages and business planning. Um, so my work was about establishing the business case for this scheme. So we set out some objectives. What was it we wanted this scheme to do for Bradford? And so these are the, the, the key things that stuck with us. And I think we delivered on um, entirely, actually. One of the um, objectives was to put Bradford on the map. Bradford is a big city. It's much bigger than people realise. Um, it underperforms in lots of ways and it's, it's under-recognised. Um, so it was important for us that people saw Bradford in a different light. We wanted it to be a place for people. This wasn't about having a nice shiny new feature that nobody locally connected with. It had to be owned for the people who live and work and make their lives in the place. So it was really important for us that people felt that connection. We don't have a lot of space in Bradford, or we didn't for events. We have a civic space adjacent, and you can just see on that plan, there's the, the triangular plot to the right, as I'm looking at the screen, is City Hall, and then in front of that is the civic space, which is Centenary Square. And there was no real space for, for celebration or events or activities. So we wanted this to be that multifunctional dynamic space that we could use. And we wanted it to glue the city centre together. It felt like the, the, the balance of the city was shifting. Retail was moving, the commercial base was moving. And this felt like it had to be somewhere that made that whole of the city and, and where it spread out from that whole really work together. And ultimately the investment was about catalyst for, for regeneration, about investment, about bringing jobs, much needed jobs, retaining jobs. It's always a challenge in cities that are underperforming to keep the jobs you've got. And so that, that was the ambition we had at the outset. And that was shared by us as the local authority, our partners at Yorkshire Forward and, and elsewhere, but also with the teams that we employ to work with us. If we move on, Olga. Some of the challenges. So there's never a good time to do these things, but we started the work um, on the business case in 2007. And then we ran into the whole um, financial crisis, the banking crisis. The, there was the whole kind of dismantling of the, um, the regeneration agencies and the infrastructure that would have supported regeneration in the way that you would have wanted. And we had the urban regeneration company, which was already starting to decline in terms of, um, I guess, buy-in from the partners who were funding it and resourcing it. And there was a scepticism about the council and its ability to deliver. We had a, a, a reputation possibly deserved for not seeing through our ambitions and our visions. And this was a very real um, opportunity to, to show that we could do what we said we were gonna do and do it in a way that was remarkable. There was at the time, partly because of the recession, but partly because we're pretty frugal people up here in the North, as you'll know, that is this a good use of money? Is this what we should be doing with our investment? And one of the conversations we've had with the panel was about how it was funded. And we went through a number of funding applications and this was a big scheme. The overall scheme was um, 24 million, if you include land acquisitions and so on. Um, ultimately, the council funded the majority of this. 17.1 million was the constru construction contract. And we funded it through the sale of the airport. So the council and Leeds Council and um, the other West Yorkshire councils on the Leeds Bradford Airport. And that's what the members decided to do with part of that investment that we received. So this was about really doing something for the people of Bradford, having benefited from an asset that they owned, if you like. At the outset, we had to have very strong leadership and we had cross-party buy-in to this project. That's not to say it wasn't without its critics or without um, concern, but we, we absolutely had to be clear about what we're trying to achieve, that we could do it well and we could do it robustly and that we would deliver what we said we were going to deliver. So they were, that was the context in which we started. And if we move on to the next slide, Olga, what that doesn't tell you is about the challenges we had on site. And so... I'm not, a, as I've said, I'm not an engineer, designer, none of those things, but that's a rather remarkable coffer dam you can see there, which is um, where our plant room sits and the pavilion building sits on top of that where we have public toilets and a cafe. Um, this is a massive civils project. This was all about what happened under the ground. So what you see on the surface is 10% of the project and it's everything under the ground that makes it work so seamlessly. And then what we've topped it off with the quality of the materials. I would recommend watching this video because I love it. There's a kind of agony and ecstasy about watching it because I relive every moment of the horrors of the two wind winters we had and all of those things and trying to keep a city functioning. You've got to bear in mind that this is right in the middle of our city centre. So across the road, you can see the Provident Financial Building being constructed. You can see the former Rhodium, which was um, going into decay and Julian will talk about later, to the 
right in front of you, there's a, a private sector development and behind you is City Hall and the Magistrates Court. So we were right in the heart of the city centre. We had to keep the city centre functioning, keep people moving through it. You can see a bus going through. Um, and we had to facilitate things like Remembrance Day. Um, I can remember a conversation with the leader of the council about making sure that veterans could get through the centre of the city up to the cenotaph. Really important that people didn't feel that this project was inconvenient in the, in the making, never mind in the, in the actual completion of it. So please take a look at that video. The link will be in the chat and it'll be available through the academy. Can we move on, please? Thank you, Olga. So what is City Park? Well, it's um, a huge public realm feature in the centre of Bradford, and it's the largest urban man-made water feature. It's got over 100 fountains, all with individual controls. It's got a jet in the middle, um, which we tend to call internally the Bradford Blast, which can go 100 feet in the air, which is slightly excessive and flamboyant, I think you'll agree. It's got trees, it's got the grass mounds you can see because we're aware it's a very hard landscape because of that flexibility about events. We wanted to soften it a little bit. Um, the lighting columns you can see were designed by Wolfgang Buttress. We wanted to introduce art into the scheme, but having a very tight budget and needing to deliver on budget, we have to do that through the, the means of making the lighting columns part of the art feature. You'll see if you've been some small concrete sculptures that cost us 35,000 pounds that Wolfgang did us a bit of a favor. Um, because we felt we wanted to, to enhance some of the work he'd done. So we've tried to be as clever as we can with the budget. On those four lighting columns around the pool, there are fixed um, laser installations and they were the first in the UK and possibly in Europe, la permanent laser installations. So at night, there are lasers that track movement and follow you around the pool. Um, and then just the mound that you can see with the trees on top and it's got its back to us, if you like, is a pavilion building and below that sits the plant room and the toilets and the, the cafe. So move on, Olga, please. Um, so did it work? It really did work. I mean, it's, it's just been a phenomenal success. So when we were designing the scheme, and I say we very royally, um, and the designers, if they're listening, will be killing me. Um, we talked a lot about what it would feel like in winter on a windy day. It's not just a sunny place to, to enjoy. And I went down on the 23rd of December when we took ownership of the site and we took the fences down. And I was stood down there in the dark, in the rain at five o'clock and there was kids running through in their wellies already and they got it. And my biggest concern was they wouldn't get it because we'd called it City Park and it didn't look like a normal park. It wasn't green, it didn't have swings in, um, but they absolutely loved it. And the picture you can see at the bottom that was the 24th of March, 2012. That was the opening day ceremony. And you can see the blue sky and the people there. We had to pick that date. We picked it six months in advance to, to avoid the pre-election period when we're not allowed to do politically um, political events or events that can be used politically. Um, so we booked that date. And in my mind, we were gonna have snow, wind, rain, blizzards, and it was glorious. It was 24 degrees. I got the sunburnt nose. It was just the most phenomenal day. And on that morning, there were people coming, the, the, the trains were packed, the buses were packed, people were walking in, Primark sold out of towels, it sold out of socks from kids playing in the water. Um, they were wheeling beer barrels down the streets from other pubs to get to the pubs in the city centre. It was just phenomenal. If we can move on again, Olga. I'll try to go as fast as I can. So since the award, what's happened? Well, it still works. It's just phenomenal. And I think one of the reasons it works is the quality of the design and the quality of the materials. We've got um, a really flexible use. We don't have lots of signs up. We're not very prescriptive about people who, how people use it. It's very safe. The granite in the mirror pool is, is not slippy. Uh, we maintain it very well um, and people look after it and care about it. And I think in terms of how it's developed since the award, um, the space has softened. I think it's got better. Um, the trees are growing, they're getting bigger. The green feels a bit greener. The stone takes a lovely feel. So anybody who, who loves a porphyry needs to come up and see our porphyry and the radial curves we've got are phenomenal. The, the people who laid them were absolute crafts people. Um, and so it's just enhanced and got better and better and people absolutely love it. So if we move on, because I'm mindful I've got to give Julian two minutes. So one of the things that Bradford, we have a very diverse community and we have a very young community and we wanted this space to be for everybody. And there is, I, I defy you to find a more inclusive space in, in the country or in, in Europe or anywhere else in the world. Everything about this space was designed to be inclusive. There are, there's a changing place for people with complex health needs and need that support. There is every element of the, the design is accessible, apart from the plant room by people in wheelchairs with mobility issues. So the pavilion building has a view over at a height across the scene. 
that is wheelchair accessible. It's got a ramp and, and I think how many spaces in the world can people in wheelchairs be able to go and ob observe in the same way that able-bodied people can? Um, we did lots of work during the design of the scheme with schools about connecting communities. So where we've got predominantly Asian communities mixing those with predominantly white communities and talking about what the city centre means to them and what this space would mean to them. And as a result of some of the work we did with the university studying the, the scheme, Professor Sophie Watson, who's done a lot of work about markets and how people come across here incidentally and everyday encounters and rubbing along, came and observed and talked to us about the space. And she was really interested in how little um, supervision there is and how the surveillance is very natural and people conform to behaviours because it's just got that feel to it. So I think it, it, it genuinely is a really inclusive space and it does bring people together. And we've had all kinds of events there. We've had Bollywood events. We've had the Todd Yorkshire start there. We've had all our own events, food events, the Curry Festival, all kinds of things. It just genuinely is Bradford's great meeting place. If we crack on, Olga, I'm gonna get Francis telling me off in a minute. So I've, I've talked about the inclusivity and about, about how people are able to use the space, whether young, old, whatever community they're from. And, and it's an easy place to navigate. You don't go in there and wonder where to go or what to do. Um, but it's a place that's got really different flavours at different times. So I think one of the things is that I'm really proud of is it's not somewhere you go once and go, I've seen it and I'm done. Because if you go again, it's different. So every day of the week, it's different because the weather's different, the number of people there are different, the water features doing different things because we've got three pools or a whole pool and we've got walkways through. And all of those things were design responses to making the space work for people. What we didn't want was this water to become a barrier so the fact that we can drain it right down or we can drain it partially means that it's absolutely no impediment to movement. It doesn't feel obstructive in any way. It absolutely enhances the space. And it adds... Sheila, one, one, one minute to go. Yep, OK, go, go, go. <laughs> Sorry, Francis. Right, I will stop now and hand out to Julie, but that, the, the pitch you can see, which looks like some sort of Turkish baths, is our plant room, and that's the, the tank for the water. All the water's on a circular system. It is the most phenomenal plant room you will ever see. We did lots of study visits, including to the marvellous Peace Gardens in Sheffield. Um, and my only ask, apart from the change in place and scheme, was that we had a plant room that people could access and work safely and easily without having to do confined spaces, training, without having to wear hard hats, without having to do cat ladders and all those things. It is the most remarkable space. We take school kids down there, we take trips down there. It is fantastic. Right, crack on. Sorry, thank you. Okay, hand over to you, Julian. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Are you ready, Julian? Uh, Julian, your microphone's still muted. Come on now. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, how um, City Park's a, a, a catalyst for, uh, for regeneration, not only in the surrounding areas, but also um, the wider regeneration plans for Bradford and uh, how that's continuing as well. Um, so it has, um, so it's got, the, it's got the magnificent setting, the City Hall and the National Science Museum already, but it's a, it's a huge catalyst for regeneration in the surrounding areas. I mean, we saw the, uh, the slide earlier uh, when it was being constructed um, and immediately in 2011, there's a headquarters building for Provident, for Provident Finance and Juries Inn which was completed. And this was, really, this was really important because it was the relocation of a, a company um, who were already, already in Bradford, uh, but needed to relocate. And they were attracted by that fantastic view that they've got over City Park. And they made, made sure that actually um, and that they were an employer that stayed in, in Bradford and their jobs for Bradford people, overlooking that uh, fantastic space of City Park. And City Park is surrounded by um, important cultural buildings. And you can see on the screen there, you've got the Alhambra Theatre and you've got the old um, Odeon Cinema. And so it's, um, it's a catalyst in that actually is still continuing to happen. So we've actually got plans in place for a 4,000 uh, capacity um, live music venue uh, for uh, Bradford Live um, with the um, um, NEC uh, being the operator uh, for, for Bradford, Bradford Live. And that's due to be completed by 2022. And then moving around, we've um, got plans for one city park, a grade A office um, scheme, um, which will um, be completed. We've got funding, we've got a development partner for that, and that's due to be completed in 2022. So it continues to be a catalyst, not just immediately, but all, all within that surrounding 
um, area around the edge of the park. So if you can move on, Olga, and we can talk about um, it being at the heart of our regeneration plans moving on. So it does continue to be the heart of regeneration now in the future. Um, it was pivotal in bringing confidence and footfall into the city centre uh, with the Broadway Shopping Centre, which you can see on the screen, which is only about, what, 500 metres away from city, city, city Park. But that was an absolute game changer uh, for Bradford and its retail offer. And it was part of that five-year regeneration programme, City Park, leading on to the opening of Broadway, which has just been so important for the, uh, for the city. And then moving on, um, moving, moving on sort of anti-clockwise on, on your screens, you've got your uh, city, city village, and um, it's, all, it's, it's very much at the heart of actually Bradford city centre become more, become more of a livable city centre. And we've got plans for a thousand new homes and north of the, uh, north of the um, city centre, which will be well connected into um, 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 City Park. But again, there is the attraction of actually being um, so close to such um, an I iconic regeneration scheme um, where there's open space and um, the cultural attractions that whole area has. And then if you move, move around, um, you can see the higher education campus. I mean, what's really important is it's close proximity of City Park to the learning quarter, so the university, the um, Bradford, Bradford College, which with this, which there's recently been um, huge um, investments in. Um, and again, that's um, City Park has been the catalyst for that. Um, our plans at the moment, we've got a really ambitious transforming cities um, fund um, um, uh, program. Um, which is looking at actually expanding what City Park has brought to um, the city centre. So actually looking at how we can expand our public realm, how we can bring walk and cycling um, into the city centre, and also importantly, get those be better physical um, and visual linkages between City Park and Bradford Interchange. If anybody knows who Bradford, if you come off the train at Interchange, you can't see City Park, you can't see that fantastic cultural quarter we've got in the middle of the city. So that will actually improve the access to, to, uh, to um, the interchange and also pave the way for our, um, our uh, potential Northern Powerhouse Rail Station, which will be coming to Bradford um, City Centre as well, which will, which will be in the vicinity of City, of City Park. So if you can move on to the next slide, Olga. And that is the iconic view of, uh, of City Park, that magnificent setting for the City Hall, and which is going to be very much a symbol, very much a part of our bid for our City of Culture bid for 2025. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila, and thank you very much, Julian. Thank you for talking so enthusiastically and passionately about City Park. Um, it's such an inspirational project on so many levels, and clearly a project which continues to inspire. Um, it's great to see that it's maturing positively and also the catalytic effect that it's having on the ongoing regeneration of the city. Um, so I'd now like to turn to the Peace Gardens and the Winter Gardens in Sheffield. They were one of the earlier finalists in the awards back in 2008 and it was also followed by the She Square project in 2010, um, a further project um, in the vicinity of the Peace Gardens and Winter Gardens, um, which forms a sequence of spaces leading from the city's main railway station to the town hall. Um, these projects have turned a city without a definable historic city centre into one that has a new heart. Um, although the project's slightly older than City Park that we've just seen, um, clearly the, uh, these projects have had a um, significant influence in Sheffield's ongoing um, city centre regeneration and the approach to the delivery of urban space. So I'd now like to introduce Simon Ogden, who's a town planner and also an academician with the Academy. Uh, he's just retired after 36 years with Sheffield City Council, uh, during which time he was Head of Regeneration for 12 years and latterly Programme Director for the Castle Creek Quarter Regeneration Project. Um, he was also Client Officer for both um, Peace Gardens and Winter Gardens, so there's probably no one better place than him to talk about the project. Um, I'd also like to um, thank Simon very much for stepping in um, to help out on this at relatively short notice. So we're very grateful to him. Simon, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, before I start, just don't forget to maximise the uh, image of the presentation and to minimise the image of me, because nobody wants to look at me for the next 15 minutes, I'm sure. Um, so uh, here is the Peace Gardens um, uh, and 
with one of many parallels with, with Bradford. Uh, here is our Victorian Town Hall. And just off to the right of the image, you can also see the, the Winter Gardens. Um, and here's the Winter Gardens again, uh, the entrance from, from Tudor Square. Um, I'm afraid where any presentation from me, you don't get away without a little bit of history. So I'm going to step back a little bit and give you some context for how uh, the heart of the city, Peace and Winter Gardens project came to be. Uh, Sheffield traces its origins back 900 years to a location around the confluence of the rivers Don and Sheaf. Uh, and that was the town centre effectively right up until the 20th century. But uh, heavy industry uh, and pollution and the extension of the city gradually moved the centre of gravity uh, of the city along this ridge between the two valleys um, uh, up to the top of Fargate, where in 1897 uh, a new town hall was built. And uh, that helped to create this rather odd uh, urban form in Sheffield, which is this two mile long shopping street, um, which uh, at its height uh, meant that virtually every major retailer had to have two branches, a bit like Noah's Ark. Um, the other thing perhaps that you need to know about Sheffield city centre uh, historically is that it was a really dense uh, um, metalworking manufacturing centre right through up until the 1980s. And so behind the, the facades of the two uh, mile long shopping centre, uh, there were factories right very close into the city centre right through an, until the late 80s. Um, and that in some ways made the city centre uh, rather low key. Uh, not a, a place that you went to visit for, for pleasure unless you were shopping, uh, drinking in the pubs, uh, perhaps going to the theatre or, 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 or the cinema. Uh, it wasn't a, a place to visit for its own sake, really. Uh, you also need to know that um, after the Blitz uh, in uh, 1941, when a substantial amount of the city centre was demolished, uh, it was replanned around uh, a typical 1950s and 60s uh, plan of concentric ring roads, uh, a civic circle, an inner ring road, and then an outer ring road. Uh, and in the period between the 50s and the 90s, we didn't manage to finish any of those. So we had part of the civic circle, this uh, concrete collar around, around the, the, the tight center, and part of the inner ring road, uh, built to kind of urban motorway standards um, uh, with uh, heavily gr grade separated junctions uh, and that chopped this two mile long shopping centre into three pieces and created these um, very um, iconic, but um, not terribly friendly uh, in, inter intersections. I, I would call them a, a triumph of road safety over public safety. Um, this is the most famous one, it's called the hole in the road, um, but there were many more. Uh, and um, by the early 1990s, um, Sheffield suffered 15 demoralizing years of depression, practical and mine closures, unemployment and unending government hostility. The competition over the out of town shopping center at Meadowhall resulted in the closure of many of the department stores, including some of the ones you can see here. Um, uh, and these really were the full Monty years. Um, uh, and our brutalist car dominated city center didn't hold up very well, had very few attractions and was visibly dying. The prospect of a Detroit-like donut city seemed like a real possibility. Fortunately, out of this crisis came a new civic vision, and it was led by three people. Councillor leader, Mike Bauer, who sadly died later on, uh, earlier on this year, the chief executive, um, now Sir Bob Kerslake, and the chief planning officer, Narendra Bajari, my old boss, who between them commissioned the first of five non-statutory um, city centre regeneration master plans. This is the first one. Uh, later, they were adopted by the Sheffield One Development Agency, which we heard uh, at something of Bradford's uh, similar agency. And, and they were subsequently reviewed and keep reconsulted on approximately every five years. Simple proposals in the first one um, included um, the, uh, the recognition that pedestrian routes were more important than vehicle routes in the regeneration of the city. Recognise this um, uh, retail spine, which later became known as the steel route. It also recognised this a new pedestrian axis that was emerging at that time between Sheffield University campus, uh, Hallam University campus and the station. Uh, and where that intersected with the shopping um, uh, axis, fortunately turned out to be where the town hall is. Um, and um, the, the aim of this plan really was um, to 
uh, develop the cultural and public realm attractions of the centre, emphasise this distinct character of different quarters, support the growth of the two universities, establish a new business district for office employment, bring residents back into the city. There were only about a thousand residents at that time and develop a, a visitor economy. And deliberate placemaking was absolutely key to that strategy. Um, this is what the Peace Gardens looked like in the mid nineties. Um, it was a former churchyard cleared in the 1938 for um, a, 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 an extension to the town hall, which never happened because the war intervened. Um, and so it was turned into a temporary garden rather optimistically called the Peace Gardens in 1939 um, in the light of uh, the Munich Agreement. Um, later on, uh, it, it was um, really the only green space in the city centre, other than churchyards, um, but it's rather formal um, uh, sort of uh, geometric network didn't encourage people to walk through it. In fact, there was a constant battle between the gardeners uh, and the public who once wanted to try to walk through here. Uh, and uh, eventually gardeners had to resort to back crash barriers and also things to stop people doing walking across the flower beds. Also, this uh, wall was ret retained. This was the wall of the old churchyard and was considered to be a, 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 an interesting historical relic, but it meant that you could see into the gardens uh, and therefore uh, by the 90s, the gardens had become notorious for aggressive street drinking uh, and petty crime. Um, at, at the back of the Peace Gardens was this building here, which was the, the town hall extension that was built in the 1970s. Um, it, it, known by everybody as the egg box for fairly obvious reasons. Um, uh, it was an un, unloved building to by and large, uh, both by the public for the outside and for those of us who had to work in inside because it was a huge open plan, sick building and cost a lot of money to heat and, uh, and cool. So in uh, the mid nineties, uh, in the light of the first city center master plan, the council took the bold decision to move out of this building, to knock it down and to make this the uh, first stage in the kind of transformation and, and regeneration of the, of the, the city center, a, a new heart of the city. Uh, they commissioned Allies and Morrisons to come up with a master plan um, for the Heart of the City project, and this is it. This is actually uh, 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 the final version. This wasn't the, the version that was originally put for, out for consultation in 1995-6. Um, that it had main, most of the same elements. So it had um, uh, two new public spaces, uh, the Summer Garden, if you like, the Peace Gardens, the Winter Gardens, a uh, covered space, uh, a new hotel, uh, the start of a central business district, which Sheffield didn't really have at the time, um, a, a four to five star hotel. There wasn't a four to five star hotel anywhere in South Yorkshire at that time. Um, and uh, some high quality residential uh, apartments, again, virtually non-existent at that time, uh, and bars, restaurants uh, and shops uh, on the ground floor. What was different about the original plan, though, was that this area, here, the Peace Gardens, was shown as a continental style paved square. Uh, and that proved massively unpopular in public consultation. People said very clearly, we want a garden. That's what that, the, the, the clue is in the name. And it was at that point that um, the city council's in-house regeneration and landscape team got involved to come up with a new design, uh, which went through two further public consultation rounds that actually satisfy what people wanted uh, to see there. Uh, and, and this is what um, came out. Uh, I should say it was very fortunate that the council team included um, a very experienced, uh, cultured landscape architect called Richard Watts, who was also a stone carver, uh, and an equally experienced, uh, ingenious and innovative engineer, Rick Bingham, who I think is with us today. Um, and they uh, were joined by a group of no less than five outstanding artists, uh, of whom more in a moment. I had to chair the meetings between these guys, uh, and believe me, it was sometimes quite uh, quite stormy. Uh, but what came out of it was, I think, an interesting solution. So as you can see from here, the layout of the new gardens recognised that really strong um, footfall desire line through the gardens and these others. So it was very, very permeable. Uh, it gave a, a great setting to the, the town hall, um, which didn't, the previous design didn't really do. Uh, and it incorporated uh, this green area, uh, which you only really appreciate when you get down into it. It's lower than the rest of the, the, the landform. Uh, there are ramps to get down into it. And when you get down into there, you discover this lush um, English style um, perennial uh, garden, uh, quite unusual at the time in, in, in city gardens. 
um, the uh, the five artists that we invited to work with us um, uh, worked to some common themes of water, stone, and steel, inspired by Sheffield's metal crafts and Pennine landscape. Brian uh, Asquith, a veteran metal sculptor who trained with David Meller, uh, created these massive bronze um, vessels uh, and a range of street furniture, um, which later became standard throughout the centre. Tracy Hayes and Richard Perry um, produced these beautiful naturalistic ceramics and stone carvings, which again echoed the, the, the river theme, the, the five rivers in Sheffield. Um, and Ian Rees um, beautifully recarved all the memorials uh, to Hiroshima, the, the Spanish Civil War, uh, and, and so on, re recounting the, the civic and the political history of the city. Um, but all this civic pride was kind of um, offset by opportunities for fun, which were deliberately provided by the rills and the central fountains, uh, which positively incite frolicking, um, and in summer become a family beach, uh, uh, on a smaller scale than in Bradford, but with very much the same in intentions. Um, and I think the, it's fair to say that um, the opening of the Peace Gardens marked a change of confidence and pride uh, being restored in Sheffield, which has gone on to see us in very good stead, both economically and in terms of people's loyalty and love of the city. It expresses a lot of things that people feel about, about the city, about it being a humane city. We had a highly theatrical opening of the gardens by the Mass Children of Sheffield, Christmas 1998. The Winter Gardens and the um, Millennium Gallery followed uh, a few years later, actually, um, uh, and stood for a time, as you can see from this aerial, in splendid isolation on the site. Uh, so popular did the Winter Gardens become as a building that there was actually a huge public outcry not to build anything around it at all, which was an impossible U-turn for the council, commercial U-turn for the council to take at that time. So um, the, the concession that was made to that public campaign was to change the layout uh, of the Allies and Morrison plan again. And this office building, which should have been square and this should have been a street, was massively uh, chamfered and cut back to create a third square, Millennium Square, uh, linking the Peace Gardens and the Winter Gardens much more strongly together. And actually, I think this was a massive improvement on the master plan brought about entirely by public pressure. You can also see from this slide the kind of regeneration impact of the public realm which, uh, on creating this new business district uh, along Norfolk Street, uh, St Paul's Tower, which is a substantial um, progress in bringing people to live back in the city centre. City centre population went up from about a, a thousand uh, to about 25,000 and rising now. Uh, and also uh, you can see here the Winter Gardens and the Millennium Galleries uh, creating this internal street, which I'll talk about a bit more. And here's, here's um, Millennium Square uh, with another public art installation, uh, always popularly known as Bob's Balls. Winter Gardens was actually the um, brainchild originally of um, one of our heads of parks, um, John Bauer, um, who uh, was a passionate horticulturalist, another one. Um, and these huge parabolic arches. Um, Tom, were part of two minutes. Uh, brought about, brought to, to fruition by Pringle, Sh uh, Sharrett and Richards, uh, architects. It was their first uh, commission uh, after the uh, practice being set up. Uh, and as you can see, the Winter Gardens are, are very much the centre of this complex of the hotel and the uh, galleries. Uh, it's, a, I would say, a space which is both classy and democratic. And, and you can see everything happening here from album launches, wedding receptions, conferences, primary school outings, uh, photographic exhibitions, all free. Um, and uh, the Millennium Gallery Street uh, takes you uh, on the, the, the quickest and best and driest route for, down to the station uh, and uh, is treated as a street, public street during the daytime. Probably accounts for why Millennium Gallery is, is nearly always um, the most visited um, art gallery in the north of England. It's absolutely essential to this, uh, the, su the subsequent success of this area has been the way that these spaces are managed. Um, Peace Gardens and Winter Gardens uh, brought about the establishment of the city centre ambassadors, uh, and they brought, I, I'm sure, because of the quality of the spaces, that it attracted a really high calibre of, uh, of candidates to join this service. Uh, and I think they conduct their activities in a spirit of welcome um, and um, uh, 
assurance rather than control and, and surveillance. Also absolutely essential to the success has been the horticultural efforts. And I'm glad that uh, Dave Gill uh, is with us from City Centre Management. I can talk about this, I'm sure, afterwards. Um, but absolutely essential to this has been this gentleman here, Mark Lawson, the Peace Gardener. He took over the uh, management of the Central uh, Gardens, including the Peace Gardens, uh, at its opening, and he's still there. And here you can see him re rather reluctantly receiving a uh, Lifetime Achievement Award from myself and, and Richard Watts one year. Um, so the legacy uh, of um, Peace and Winter Gardens um, can be seen in the whole of the gold route because the standard that was set there was then uh, extended uh, from down to the railway station, Sheaf Valley Park, and then up to um, Barker's Pool, Devonshire Green, and more recently to uh, the um, University campus and Sheaf Valley Park. So uh, that standard and that continuity of management and um, quality materials uh, and standard uh, um, um, street furniture was continuing. And along that route, most of the major regeneration uh, innovations, sometimes called the Magnificent Seven, uh, occurred, um, including um, the establishment of Heart of the City too, which I'll come to again in a minute. But the, um, the, the design approach to um, uh, public space in Sheffield hasn't stood still. Um, and you can see that, for instance, in the Greater Green Corridor, uh, this is a kilometre and a half of um, former inner ring road um, converted now into um, rain gardens and um, flowering meadows as part of the regeneration of the northeast part of the, of the city centre and incorporating um, sustainable urban drainage. Uh, and this uh, meadow style planting, which was developed by our in-house team, uh, again, Zach Tudor, who is heavily involved in, in the design of this, is with us and can talk about this and other schemes that are happening at the moment. Um, and also with the involvement of, of um, uh, Nigel Dunnett, Professor Nigel Dunnett from the University of Sheffield. And uh, phase two of Greater Green opened in September of this year uh, and just transformed the riverside of, she uh, of Sheffield where the city, city began at the start of the story. Also, Heart of the City has um, spawned a second phase, Heart of the City 2, uh, which is actually expanding uh, the impact into this area here, uh, creating a new consolidated shopping centre but with lots and lots of things going on at the upper levels, as you can see here. Um, and as part of Heart of the City 2, this road that runs through here, uh, Pinson Street, is going to be uh, untrafficked, uh, and the Peace Gardens is going to be extended right up to this new hotel, the Radisson Hotel, which is uh, just about to start work on site uh, in converted existing buildings. Um, Charter Square, which is one of the other squares in that area, uh, Heart of the City area, has been completed already. Uh, won a commendation at R the RTPI Awards last week um, and again incorporates many of the same themes, stone, steel, uh, no water in this case, but the um, uh, uh, more sophisticated meadow planting that uh, was developed through, for Greater Green also features in here. Um, and that's been rolled out now in something called the Connecting Sheffield programme, which is again about uh, in increasing walking and cycling in the city centre in the light of the, the need to get people in, into more active travel modes. So just to conclude, some key learning points. As you can see, this has been placemaking led regeneration from the start. It relied on a very strong focused leadership, certainly in the early years, uh, because there were several times when, when the, the Labour group might have lost confidence, but were kept on, 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 on track by strong political and officer leadership. The in-house team uh, capacity is also absolutely essential, I think, to the consistency uh, and the continuity and the way the space is linked together um, and, and innovate, uh, because that team has been open to collaboration uh, uh, as well. The regular master plans, review and reconsulted, both had an impact on the actual evolution of the city, but also kept the public um, informed and, and engaged. I think that was equal important, so people actually understood hopefully what uh, the, the spaces were being disrupted for and, and what the ultimate shape was. The use of public land ownership, absolutely essential that the, the, the city owned that land and in fact acquired land for Heart of City 2 and used it in a bold way. Intelligent funders, I particularly wanted to want to uh, commend the Millennium Commission uh, on this. The fact that they were willing to pay for art uh, and uh, high quality crafts uh, was essential to getting setting that benchmark, which we've then been able to follow consistently since. 
Uh, and that then also resulted in clear design guidance and a materials palette, um, which um, we've been able to apply to other spaces, not rigidly, but so that there is a continuity and a local distinctiveness. Um, and then, uh, as I've said already, long-term management and horticulture spaces, the fact that they still look as good as they did when they were finished and that they're managed in a friendly uh, and welcoming way. And all of this, I think, gave confidence in the city, or back to the city, um, from the private sector. And it meant that we could negotiate with the private sector from a, a, a position of strength and quality. I think that's absolutely essential. Uh, so that's all I want to say. Thank you very much for listening. Simon, thank you very much indeed for that fascinating uh, insight into uh, Sheffield's experience. Um, clearly many similarities with, with City Park in Bradford, um, but I think it's also quite interesting to compare and contrast approaches. So I hope that will generate some further questions and some discussion and debate um, in the uh, end part of the, the overall session. Um, turning to our third and final finalist now, uh, the Viking Triangle in Waterford, Ireland. Um, they were a winner of the Great Places category in 2017. It was the first one I acted as uh, lead assessor for. Um, and I was really struck by the passion of all those involved. I think one of the strengths of the Urbanism Awards is that they can pick out some examples uh, that are maybe not always widely known and perhaps haven't always received the attention they deserve. And I think the Viking Triangle is very much one of those. It's really remarkable what's been achieved um, in the Viking Triangle in a, in a space of barely a decade. Um, both in terms of physical and cultural regeneration and also changing the perception of a place. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Rupert Maddock, who's a senior architect with Waterford City and County Council, um, who with his small in-house team have been instrumental in the regeneration of the Viking Triangle. I'd also like to introduce Eamon McAnini, uh, who's the director of Waterford Museum of Treasures. Um, and he's been very much uh, responsible for the remodeling and revitalization of the city's museums, um, which have formed an integral part of Waterford's strategy. Um, I also understand that Eamon was responsible for uh, conceptualizing the idea of the Viking Triangle back in 2007. Um, so Rupert was involved in the original assessment back in 2016. Um, so it's great to welcome him back um, to update on how the uh, Viking Triangle project has served as not only a catalyst for further regeneration, but also provided a benchmark by which other communities in other parts of the city and the wider area have um, very much wanted to emulate. So, uh, Rupert, over to you. Um, thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Everybody hear me? Um, can. Um, just can hear now. Okay, so... Um, Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the Academy for um, uh, uh, allowing us to present Waterford as, as you mentioned. Uh, it's probably um, a place that's probably a little bit less well known to some of your uh, listeners. So I thought I'd just uh, take a moment or two just to set uh, Waterford to explain a little bit about the city and set it in context. Um, so Waterford is a small... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rupert, we cannot see your slides. Have you... Really? Yes. Okay, apologies. Uh, okay. Okay. Now everything come up there? Yes. Yeah. So I, I thought I would just um, uh, set, set the background a little bit, set more of it in its context, uh, in national context and regional context. And it's a, it's a in Irish terms, it's a it's a city, but it's it's a city of about fifty five thousand people. Uh, so it's really in, in probably European UK context, uh, a large town. Um, it um, it sort of uh, sits in the southeast of Ireland, which is probably an area, a region that is um, probably has been um, under um, lack, has been exposed to a lack of investment over an extended period of time. And also, you can see in the infographics on the right hand side there. Um, where Dublin uh, has sort of dominates the sort of economic uh, landscape of the country and uh, also population wise. And, and so Waterford is sort of in its sort of uh, corona there just outside its sort of gravitational field. And I suppose one of the things that has always interested us as to how 
a relatively small urban centre like Waterford can, you know, make its mark and sustain itself and uh, get, get a critical mass. Um, um, so, uh, you know, there's been successive um, governments over the years that have seen this sort of as national asymmetry possibly as not the best way forward and uh, have developed um, national planning frameworks in which to try and, uh, try and I suppose, persuade or distribute growth uh, more evenly in a more balanced fashion. So uh, there's a plan called Project Ireland 2040, a sort of 20-year plan uh, for the social, economic, and cultural development of the country. And, and, and that uh, includes as part of it a, a sort of an economic a national development plan, which is a shorter term plan, 10-year plan. And uh, that's part of that plan, uh, part of the money from that plan, uh, we're going to take advantage in terms of continuing to invest in Waterford and in the Viking Triangle. Um, this national plan also intends to try and push uh, development uh, uh, growth um, and, and sort of spread it around the country, sort of according to a 50-50 rule. So 50% of growth outside of Dublin and 50% of that into sort of five major cities. And of that growth, then all of that should be within the sort of uh, urban uh, uh, zone and, and not spreading out of the periphery. Um, So, um, Waterford, uh, this, this is a, 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 a painting of Waterford taken about, uh, painted in about 1736. Um, it, was, it shows uh, Waterford as a port city. Uh, it has a long history as a port city. It, has a, um, it was uh, founded by the Vikings. Uh, it has its vicissitudes, ups and downs over the years. But this painting was, was done to um, show that the, the city was open for business, that uh, they took pride in their keys, and uh, that. And I'll show you a picture of the keys now, and it shows a different picture. But the the city is, I suppose, like many post-industrial small towns, it it reached a kind of nadir about 20 to 25 years ago, uh, as with loss of jobs and and. Um, moving in the port downstream and is sort of transitioning in the last 20 years or so to um, sort of a more modern economy, pharmaceuticals and so forth, and, um, and, uh, and a sort of um, engineering uh, and um, so forth. So th this, these two pictures just give an idea of what the city is, uh, some of the problems and the challenges that we face in the city today. Uh, now, I must say, this is, all of the city doesn't look like this. Uh, this is just to give you a flavor of some of the challenges, particularly from about 2007 onwards. Uh, you can see uh, this issue of the asymmetric city where we've, much of the growth has happened south of the city, uh, and we want to now re-envisage the city as being centered on the river and spread the growth north, uh, to the north as well. Um, this, the city has also been very much um, asymmetric east and west. And even the, interestingly enough, the, the original sort of historical growth of the city started off of what, so the eastern end and grew to the west rather than concentrically. Uh, the South Keys will come back to you, but you can see that we had a lot of problems that other urban centres would have, would have or would have had. A common street showing the lack of vitality, the predominance of cars, Prey Key. This, this is an issue where related to land values really, where the cost of actually regenerating the buildings uh, and for developers to come in and put money into buildings, uh, if you add that to the, the, the cost, the acquisition cost of the building, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, equate to the actual value, the, 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 the sale value of the building. So there's a sort of negative return on investment. If you go back to 2007, this is what we faced in the Viking Triangle. Uh, it was almost had reached a point of no return. Uh, and as a really the result of a hundred years of lack of investment. Um, uh, a lot of dereliction, vacancy, um, um, inappropriate use. And so uh, something had to be done. Um, and how did we address these challenges? Uh, we often start um, when we look at new areas, we always try to look at the mobility issues first. And um, this is a rather classic, I suppose, ring road uh, arrangement, but it shows, it shows the, the, the approach that we took to try and make the city centre a destination so uh, that we created a, a, a transportation structure 
that allowed for a more, more sustainable use of the city centre. Um, so that parking over 50 or nearly 50% of the workers uh, in Waterford actually commute in from, from the outside, from the hinterland. So there's a very strong of the car uh, culture still, and it'd be hard to get away from that given the sort of density of the, of the region. Um, it doesn't support, uh, it doesn't support public transport really. Um, so uh, with, by placing the parking, car parking around the edges, and making the city centre destination so that so there's no true traffic, then we could then make, make the city centre more sustainable transport friendly, uh, predom predominantly uh, pedestrian and public transport. Now, in recent years, overlaying on this, we've been um, developing this uh, um, sort of green route network, which is really based on the old uh, railroads and um, converting these into um, cycle green pedestrian routes. And they are now overlapping on this more classic uh, urban road network. And, um, and, and we, I'll show you some pictures of how they, they, they're manifesting itself. But they're all connecting and meeting in the city centre. So there'll be, there's nearly 200 kilometres of, of this new sustainable transport network, which will sort of um, uh, eventually sort of connect uh, in, in the middle of the city. So, and this is, this is um, what we're ending up with now. You can see the top right, this is the, a view of this same street actually. Um, and you can see a car dominated in the top right. And then uh, over the last 20 years, we've been um, introducing uh, uncluttered, high quality uh, public realm landscape, um, reducing uh, vehicles and, and giving uh, um, priority to, to pedestrians. And on the, on the bottom right there, you can see that we create a lot of new public ground spaces for events. So this is where the Viking Triangle started, starts to come in. Um, at that point in 2007, we had really not much conception of how the city centre was going to be organised. But um, uh, the, with the, with the um, sort of allocation of the sort of eastern, the historic part of the city, and designating it and giving it this, uh, giving this, this the, 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 uh, a new character and a new uh, sort of fra uh, um, planning framework. Um, it, it set, I suppose, uh, sort of the marching direction for the rest of the city. And as one of the, it is one of the things that uh, the ripple effect, I suppose, of the Viking Triangle. But um, so over the years, we've, uh, based on the success of the Viking Triangle, we're we've been developing other quarters, the cultural quarter to the west, uh, but they're all based on some kind of uh, underpinning, historical underpinning. So there's a relationship to what the, those areas and, and, and what their uses were originally. So the, the western part of the city would have been the 18th century extension, the Viking Triangle on the, the original uh, Viking and Anglo-Norman city. Um, so what is the Viking Triangle? The, the Viking Triangle uh, is, is the location where the Vikings uh, first set up the historic city. Uh, it's where most of the, I suppose, the important um, uh, architectural heritage of the, of the city is located. Um, it's a, what, an innovative, multi-layered, multi, multi disciplined conservation or consolidation and tourism initiative. So the key words there is that we see it as conserving the buildings. It's a tourism initiative based on uh, um, cultural development uh, and development of museums, which is then uh, sort of being used as a backbone to add on complementary uses. And so uh, what we did, in fact, was we, uh, we and, and, and led by Eamon, we took the original museum and we split it into three new museums um, based chron chronologically, if you can see my pointer here, um, the, the oldest was the um, Reginald Tower, where the Viking artifacts were are located and are exhibited. And then this new medieval museum here, which was developed in 2011. And then uh, the uh, 18th century Bishop's Palace. All of these are strung out along the medieval town wall, which was used as a connector. So they're seen as like elements along, like a necklace. And the idea was that it was museums without walls. So this backbone, cultural backbone, uh, sort of related to the urban public realm so that you could move in museums and out into the, into the urban 
landscape and there was a seamlessness there and a story which um, there was a dialogue relating backwards and forwards. And um, so that then was the backbone a bit on, upon which uh, other projects were, 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 were added, improvements to the public realm, uh, adding retail, ad adding housing and so forth. Um, so we used a very, very strong sort of urban design principles. We added, and the, these are two diagrams in the bottom left there. You can see um, the addition of new public ground spaces. Uh, there was originally only one, and then we added a whole multiplicity of new public ground spaces, large and small. And then we added connectivity, uh, new nodes, new routes, uh, some of them which were inter internal to buildings, but mostly pedestrian. And I'll just quickly go through some of the buildings. This was one of the sort of the landmark uh, development, the Medieval Museum. This is, these are before and after shots. Um, as Eamon said, this is like open heart surgery in, in the Viking Triangle and uh, was, is the, one of the primary attractors. Uh, creating new public space, new plaza. Um, I, again, you can see the before and after. Here we, we swapped this inappropriate building where my pointer is, demolished it and created this new uh, appropriate plaza around Reginald's Tower. Um, we uh, introduced high quality residential, uh, opened up new routes that had been closed. Uh, this was an important medieval route that had been closed for 50 years and we opened it up again. Uh, we repaired the urban fabric uh, where buildings had lost their initial, original sort of sense and had been converted into in inappropriate uses. So we would go back and look at what the building originally looked like and try and reinterpret it in a contemporary sense, not sort of blindly taking, or trying to reproduce an authentic uh, um, sort of reproduction of what was there, but uh, just recreate the nature uh, and its public presence. Um, regeneration of the backlands, removing uh, sort of all the, the mess, the sort of industrial mess that would have accumulated accreted over the years, opening it up and double-siding buildings such that retail faced it front and back and created new, new, uh, created new routes. Uh, introduced appropriate complementary um, uh, sort of commercial and craft and uh, um, uses uh, to um, spaces, vacant spaces. And some, this building was actually quite an inexpensive building. As a sort of uh, quite just uh, was, didn't cost a lot of money and it opened up onto the street and it has a small industrial furnace, a glass blowing out, which adds a sort of animation to the street. Um, signage and sculpture, very important. And we, we seamlessly add that into the narrative and they relate the, the, the adjoining buildings. And we used, uh, we used the, the, the uh, sculpture and, and signage to try and reveal and reinterpret some of the lost history that actually some of the residents of Waterford might have forgotten about and bring it to the, to the fore again. Um, so now I'll just pass over to Eamon who will take you through, we see the, the Viking Triangle as an ongoing uh, process. We don't see it ever ending actually. Uh, and Eamon will take you through what's been happening over the last four years. Okay, over to you Eamon. Yeah, um, there, there you can see an, an extension of, of the Viking Triangle in, into the Anglo-Norman part. A um, place called the Apple Market, which was which Rupert managed the enclosing of that space there, so that you kind of theatre and we had a big. We were involved with the European um, follow the Vikings, and we had a big uh, light and sound show and theatre show there um, last Easter, twelve months, and it was absolutely fantastic to get the reflection in the in the the merge um, roof of that that space. So it was a wonderful public space for people to to enjoy um, events there. Um, what we've been doing since is that originally the three museums, when we started, when we brought the museums from a, from a, a museum that had been created in 1999, we decided in 2007 to, to, to leave that building and do the, the, the ones that change it to a different pattern so that they'd become part of the focus of regenerating the historic Viking Triangle. Um, but and when that was that was very typically in some ways slightly old fashioned that we, we broke up the history into into the, the normal pieces of, of the Viking period, the Anglo-Norman medieval period, and then the, the modern period from 1690 onwards. Um, so that was a chronology, the history of, of the city. And then we started to focus on, on other things uh, and basically to enliven that a piece. So we in, developed a, a, a new experience. Reginald's Tower was, was, was a quite a static experience. 
we manage that with the Office of Public Works here and it's a historic building so the, the exhibition there was very minimalist it was an archaeological exhibition so to bring the Vikings to life the original Viking fort was where a monastery was later built and we brought in a virtual reality um, experience there in 2017 and that's been absolutely huge it's, it's done in a small house that only takes 10 people but it's a house based on an archaeological excavated house from the in the city center and I have to say it's been the most successful thing we've done in terms of visitor numbers it's absolutely huge uh, it's, it's we use basic um, it's virtual reality and storytelling it's a mix half the experience is storytelling um, with the actor there you can see the chap lined up there just uh, and then um, VR then in City Hall again part of democratization opening up the place City Hall is the building next to the Bishop's Palace which, which you see on your on your top left hand screen, the, the next building down is, is City Hall. And to make that, to open up that building and to make it more democratic, we, we um, did a history of the mayoralty there and we've listed every single mayor, the, the names and lights there that you can just about make out were part of, of the, are the names of nearly 700 mayors of the city going back to the, to the 13th century. Um, that, that was another part of the project uh, of, uh, taken by the museum. It's not a museum, but it's, it's an exhibition within City Hall so that people visiting and the public when they come in can be aware of their history. And again, a sense of, of pride and people. It's, it's a very dramatic way of doing it. There are some objects in the exhibition, but it's really not object focused. It's about the list of names. And when you see the list of names, it's quite um, evocative that you can see a whole list of names, unbroken list of names um, go, going back to the 1200s. Uh, we, we'll move on to the next slide, Rupert. Uh, then we decided to, to develop as part of Rupert's idea there of, of opening up the, the um, public realm. You can see we put in this big Viking sword, it's a carved sword from a wooden uh, tree that fell and we left the roots on it. And it basically it, into it is carved the story of the coming of the Vikings and it ends up with the, with the, uh, with the ex, expulsion of the Vikings from the Viking Triangle when the Anglo-Normans come in 1170. The areas you can see all railings and car parking are all taken out of that. And in behind that, you can see where the virtual reality experience is. So that's linking up and, and just a few meters away from that is Reginald's Tower. So that whole area there, it shows how the area evolved from what was once a Viking fort to now becoming a, a monastery after the Anglo-Norman settlement. Um, you can also see there the, the palace of the a new, a new sculpture in the Bishop's Palace uh, garden, which was once a car park. So we'll move on, Rupert. Uh, in, in, in the Bishop's Palace, then we decided to again enliven that. And this started us thinking of how we're we going to develop the Viking Triangle from just a, the, the museums there from just a chronological history of the city. So obviously our great trade has been in glass making. That's a big industry in the 18th and into the 19th century. So in the palace, we kind of concentrated then on, we change around the displays a bit on the history of glass making and put obviously more glass out and all the rest of it and got an original chandelier from the National Museum. Uh, and then we do a three, it's a 3D um, 15 minute experience on the history of glass making in Waterford, which began our, our process then of thinking, how can we develop the Viking Triangle further? And we're looking at craftsmanship. So the first iteration was to look at the history chronological history. Now we're looking at craftsmanship and the most famous craft in Watford was, was, was silver, was, sorry, was glass making. So um, then by luck, I suppose, in many ways, and by the fact that the whole Viking Triangle project was such, such success, we got people coming to us. And within the next three or four weeks, we're going to open up two new museums. One of them is on the history of, of silver making in Ireland. We've got now probably the, the biggest collection of Irish silver in the world next to the National Museum in Ireland, but some really unique piece the National Museum doesn't have. And here you see the building that was once an office beside the medieval museum has now been turned into, into um, a museum. So it's, it's the Irish Silver Museum. And we have rooms and that uh, set out. We hope to get the whole building over time, but there's still offices above it because it's a council owned building now. And um, so that, that'll open in about two weeks time and providing we can have visitors. And um, then uh, again, the, the success of that, the success of the Viking Triangle has allowed us to, the, the, these collections to be given to us, these wonderful collections of Irish silver. So we're into craftsmanship and the making of Irish silver. And in that, again, we've got a gold and gold and silver smith. Uh, he, he does all his own work and diamond mounter. He's got a shop within this. So the shop comes first. So it's bringing the retail and the urban renewal, uh, linking them up quite solidly. 
And then a few yards from there, just where you see the tower in the background of the left-hand picture there, the, the, the tower of the old Franciscan Friary, a, a building there, a church there, if you move on, Rupert, and this is Great Friars Church. It used to be a gallery. You see the horrible domestic garage beside it. We, we approached City Council and the, the council were developing um, uh, uh, Georgia Street on the more Georgian part of the city and they were calling it a... a, a I remember, uh, would you be able to wrap up in a moment, please? Yeah, yeah it was... I want to take some time for questions, that's all. So we, we decided to ask for that building and we got the council to, to buy to buy another building down in the arts quarter to put the art gallery there and we developed this into a clock and watch museum. All the clocks and watches were given to us, the biggest collection of Irish clocks and watches in the world given to us because of the success of the Viking Triangle. In fact, part of this, more than half the money for this has come from one private donor from Dublin, not from Waterford, but uh, to develop this museum. Okay, could we, could we um, wrap things up there? That was absolutely fascinating. I'm sorry we couldn't have been able to let you talk for a bit longer. Um, this is such a, a kind of rich um, series of projects. Um, and the last slide is just the new Viking centre that we're, we're going, we're getting funding for, which will also be in the Viking Triangle. It's much bigger. Okay. Um, at this point, I'd like to thank you all for your fascinating presentations um, and agreeing to participate during these challenging times. I think with the virtual uh, format we've adopted, it's provided some new opportunities, um, particularly those that have been unable to attend the award ceremony in the past. So I'd like to move over to questions. Um, I'm very aware that we are run overrunning um, a bit in terms of programme. So I'm going to skip my um, assessor questions. Um, but does that have anyone have any overarching questions that each of the um, places can respond to that they'd perhaps like to start off with? Anybody? Yeah. David, do you want to Hi. start off? Yes. David here. Um, yeah, fantastic. It's really interesting just looking at the chat in response to these three um, presentations. Uh, two, two, two elements have come out. One is the, the context of each of these places um, has been a major um, part of the presentation. And that's because Obviously, the context in terms of a smaller space or a, in terms of the uh, award system, looking at cities right down through neighbourhoods, towns, streets, um, um, down to places, it's, it's difficult to um, sort of convey the, um, the detail that goes into the process of delivering something in a place, in a city or a town. And um, that's something that's uh, both occupied the presentation and uh, created questions and, and observations in, in response. And that's the context in, and specifically with Simon saying, you can't get away without a bit of history. It's absolutely true. It's interesting point we're at now is the future where we're all a bit sort of um, perhaps unnaturally and even more unsure about the future and uh, what, what, if anything, these places will um, catalyze for the future and to wrap it into the fact that we sit here now in a, in a COVID situation or positively a post-COVID situation. Um, perhaps each presenter would quickly sort of comment on what I've said there, that um, what, what hope do you have for, for what I think was referred to in Waterford as the ripple effect and in both Bradford and uh, Sheffield, the catalytic effect for other places and spaces to be created as a result of this fantastic initiative that's taken place over the last decade between you um, in any order. Shall we start with uh, with Bradford without wishing to put you on the spot? Okay, I'll go first if that's all right, Julian. I don't know if you want to add anything, but I think for me, um, I, t I talked a little bit about the timing, the challenge of the time in the recession. And one of the challenges for Bradford um, perennially, perennially is that we tend to go into recession earlier than other places. It hits harder and stays longer. So we've kind of always been in this cycle of being behind the curve and having to fight the circumstances and context at the time. And that's a challenge. I think with COVID, I'm doing a lot of work with partners and my teams around recovery planning. And one of the things I feel that Bradford is really well positioned for now is having a better place in the future, not rebuilding what we had and the economy we had. 
and how that's represented and manifested in the place, the district. Um, so one of the things that I've been um, chastised for many times by our leader and chief executive is the undersupply of private rented sector accommodation in the city centre. We're, we're building very slowly our residential. Actually, I'm really glad that we don't have a legacy of what we would have had is poor quality PRS. I'm not saying all quality, all PRS is poor quality, but because our values were historically low and because Bradford was not perceived as a residential market of uh, choice, it was one of last resort, we would have had a legacy of, of property and, com and commercial and residential uses that were a, a challenge for us. And I think we're in a position where we're moving forward with our plans for increasing residential through schemes like City Village at the top of time where we're looking at thousand units on what was a former market hall and supermarket. Um, that will be a desirable place to live. And I think one of the things we talked about from COVID is how people feel about their homes and their environment and city centre living. Um, city Park, we, we, we've talked with Julian about how it's um, it's not a green lung because it's not a green park, but actually it's a public space where people can go and sit, they're outside, they're, they're relaxed, it's safe, it's secure. Um, and I think that principle about making the city centre livable and desirable is a real opportunity for places like Bradford that have perhaps missed on the boom in previous decades that now we can do something different because we're not hamstrung by the legacy of the past um, because that legacy would not have been the quality of the Victorian heritage we've got that is also a challenge to bring back into use. So I, th I think it's really great for smaller places. I'm working with colleagues across the city region and, and Leeds have got some really major challenges. You know, Leeds is a fantastic city and a really example of a city um, you know, capitalising on its assets, but actually it, where we are with COVID, with retail, with what's happening in residential and high rise and all of those things, they've got some really big challenges. So I think for smaller places and places that perhaps have had to fight for where they've got to, this is a real opportunity to do it differently and look at health and well-being and, and the importance of place. So I'll leave it there. I'm sorry because I'll go on yeah, again. But... That's fine. That's great. Simon, what, what, what do you think about how places can be the catalytic uh, precursor of something better and bigger and in the future well in, in, in the immediate sense uh, if, if, you, if you go to the peace gardens today you'll see that the the area immediately to the north of the peace gardens is a forest of cranes um so heart of the sea too is storming ahead um the first phase has already been let um to um hsbc and uh, cms who have moved in um and some of the retail units or most of the retail units actually have been taken up despite uh everything against them um uh, and it is a mixed-use quarter now. It's not the new retail quarter, which we used to talk about. So it's not, hopefully, uh, totally dependent on, on shopping. Um, but I think the wider impact is that the story I told, uh, unfortunately, was quite a lot about how we had to kind of dismantle qu quite a lot of what the traffic engineers had done in the 60s and 70s with the best of intentions for road safety and, and so on. I think now... There is a lot of evidence that the traffic engineers get the, the, the need for walking and cycling and making those, that experience pleasant. And so the kind of um, uh, public spaces that Zach and his team are, are now designing, the, 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 the hiring engineers are very keen on them. Um, so actually there's, there's much more unity of purpose, I think, um, across the transport and public realm vision than, than there was when we started. Yeah. Uh, and also building in climate change resilience uh, yeah. and habit, richer habitat and low maintenance. So um, I think I think that that's as much of a legacy as anything. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that uh, heartening words. Uh, Rupert, what do you think about um, the future now and your your ripple effects? Well, I, I suppose the one thing that um, uh, was kind of happenstance, really, in, in terms of the way we've been dealing with the public realm here in Waterford, it was a sort of, uh, maybe it wasn't intended originally, but it almost made us a very COVID friendly place uh, in terms of the, the uh, being um, prepared for, for something like this. And that the whole, I'd say Waterford in relation to its size is probably some, the most extensive amount of public realm anywhere in the country and even probably more widely. Uh, the, almost the entire area within the old set city walls is now pedestrian uh, friendly and, and traffic, uh, very reduced traffic. And what that has meant in effect is that we've uh, uncluttered the public realm, we've reduced, uh, we've taken away the curbs, um, we've introduced very high quality materials. So the space, uh, that's, that's the key thing. 
people, the, the, the retailers, almost immediately when, when, when the lockdown happened uh, and as it was began to be relaxed over the summer, um, the, the food and beverage outlets and the, retail, uh, the commercial premises were able to easily sort of flow out onto the public realm. And uh, so, so it, it, um, I, I think, as was mentioned by, by one of your earlier speakers there, the, the idea of sort of um, almost the, the, the quality, the, the sort of sensory ap 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 aspect of the, cult of the public realm, its, its, its relationship to improving human health, um, having all these different types of spaces, making the public realm a kind of a creative uh, canvas. It's like, a, it's like a stage, a public stage set for creative use. Um, I think that there's this interesting thing of uh, this re sort of calibration of the way people work. Um, and the idea I, sp I spoke about earlier with the museums of museums without walls, now the concept of sort of offices without walls. And so, Maybe what we can think of almost a seamlessness now between the office, the public realm, and the home, and there's no kind of strong division between them. And really, you're looking at uh, trying to create and uh, make creative environments and and exciting environments and flexible environments. Uh, I think I think that to me is is the way forward. Um, and it's it's. It's, it's sort of seeing the public realm both as a safe place, but also a very democratic place. It's, it's open to use by all, all sections of society and all age groups. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. That's great. Uh, three great, actually very positive answers to my question because I find it very hard to be positive at the moment um, for, for all the reasons we share. Over to you, Francis. I think we're running out of time, aren't we? Yeah, I think I'd just like to take uh, one question from the, the floor. Um, yeah. I think we've probably got time to do that. Um, it's from Claire St. Martin. Um, she's asking, how would northern cities in England like investment to be channeled to rebalance the north-south prosperity divide? And has Ireland's 2040 plan been helpful to rebalancing Ireland's economy? So um, again, if we go to Bradford first on that particular question. Okay, uh, I think one of the it's interesting because I'd written down and, and mentioned about traffic and highways engineers from Sheffield is that's one of the big learnings we took our highways um, head of highways at the time pre Julian um, down to Sheffield and met the team from, from Simons <laughs> to talk about what they'd done about taking traffic out so traffic and highways is a, a big issue for us. Um, sorry, Francis, can you just remind me where he was because I was just distracted. <laughs> Simon. Um, it's, it's how would northern cities in England yeah. like investment so be challenged. The whole levelling up thing, the, the reason I got onto highways when distracted by Simon is that we, it, we're a little bit anachronistic because we're, we're dealing with an infrastructure deficit and that's a really problematic issue for us because we're still looking at highways, introducing new roads, introducing the station, the Northern Powerhouse Rail. We should have been doing that 30 years ago, 50 years ago. We should never have taken it away. So it, I think the challenge for us is we've got to get back up to a playing field where we are competitive. And at the moment we're not. And I think my big concern is that we don't create the same inequity and um, disparity of resources across the north that we've got north south. So I think the big push is for government to be um, strategic and work with the, the devolved authorities. And, and as we move forward next year to a mayor in the Leeds City region, it's about being really smart about where that investment goes, dealing with the deficit, but also looking at the future and that whole 2070 levelling up. So I don't know if Julian wants to add anything as a big infrastructure. Yeah, yeah I, I'd support um, when you ask that question, the first thing that comes to mind is, is, is infrastructure um, more than anything else. Um, and as, as Sheila says, we are, we are playing catch up. We're making small strides to actually make sure we do catch up around infrastructure, roads and rail stations and everything else. But we do need more investment. And Northern Powerhouse Rail, that's a, re that's a really good example of that. It's, yeah. it's really yeah. looking at schemes that can be transformational. Uh, for the for the north of England, in the same way that actually those schemes have been taken forward in the, in the south of England, because we've got to work so much harder to be able to make those business cases work in the in the north. So we've got to look at a bit more longer term and what would be transformational for us, so we can you know connect our cities, but also um, be better uh, you know connecting um, uh, within our cities 
as well and looking at yeah and you can always and you can also look at city park just what that's opened up for those those sorts of opportunities uh mm -hmm. within within our northern cities and, and sheffield of course so i realize you're in the same geographical region but could you maybe uh respond to that quickly yeah i, I i'd underline actually what julian just said i think um we, we really need uh government to take our public transport needs a bit more seriously interconnectivity between um Sheffield Manchester, Sheffield Liverpool, Sheffield Leeds uh, is pitiful, non-existent with Bradford virtually uh, by, by rail. Uh, and we've got a fantastic tram system, which we struggle to, to extend. Um, so uh, take those things seriously for the amount of population uh, and the economy involved. Thank you. Uh, Rupert, could you maybe just uh, quickly respond to that from an Irish perspective? Um, I know you have the national planning strategy in Ireland and that perhaps puts a, a different emphasis on things. Yeah, yes, certainly. So I think um, um, always we see it as a, 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 this new approach or this approach and this national approach of trying to spread out uh, um, population growth throughout the country is a great opportunity. I suppose it's, it's a, it seems to be, um, you know, the, the, the economic sort of appraisal of this is sort of changing over time, I guess. You know, the, the idea that you have, uh, like London uh, in the UK and Dublin here, you have the sort of economic powerhouse that is sort of mm -hmm. is needed really to kind of uh, sustain the, 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 the national economy. That's, I suppose, the, 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 um, uh, the dilemma here. And, and it's, you know, is it a good thing or not a good thing? It is generally seen perceived to be not a good thing, perhaps in the long run, mm -hmm. that you you know, you, you have to sort of uh, disperse growth. Um, perhaps this new, um, um, the, the, the COVID issue uh, and remote working maybe gives yeah. opportunity for smaller towns and, and cities like Waterford to, to offer a different, um, have a different offer, a high quality living environment, uh, less, less cluttered, less, um, you know, lo perhaps lower, low, lower densities. Um, I, I think it, uh, it, it maybe gives us a, a, a sort of a, an opportunity to, to, um, to create a different, a different offer, as I said. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the scheme that the government has here is a, it's a competitive scheme. So um, this uh, URDF fund that we're, we have put in an application earlier this year in, uh, to, to try and put, to put more funding into the Viking Triangle, we actually had to, uh, you know, make an application and uh, to show how successful the Viking Triangle was. We we're using that now to try and leverage uh, money from these funds to put into the. So I, I think it's time will tell Francis as to whether it's successful or not this, this, this uh, push to disperse development. Um, and of course, and the dynamics of it are changing over the time. But I think generally it's seen as a positive and a good thing and an equitable thing to do to try and disperse economic and population growth growth in the country. Not difficult. It's 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 a time-consuming thing to do. It's a it's a it, it's a sort of ten tens decades really. I think to turn turn the ship around. It's not like mm -hmm. it's not like a sprint. It's it's a it's it's more of a marathon to try and reorientate global uh, you know national economies. I think uh, in terms of their geographic spread. Okay, Rupert, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I would have really loved to have asked more questions, but I think unfortunately time has got the better of us. So I'd really um, like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers again for all their fantastic presentations. Um, I'd also like to thank Alda and Linda at the Academy. Um, it's been a particularly challenging um, in relation to the awards this year, given the pandemic. But I think it's with their persistence and persuasion and organisation um, that's made all this possible.